Okay, so uh, we will continue from where we left off last time. So we will we'll go through it uh, quickly and if there are doubts please stop me and ask. So you have seen the basic idea of merge sort, we take an array, divide it into two parts, then sort each of the individual parts and then merge them back. Right? This is what we saw last time and these are the three uh, sort of tasks. One is to divide an array into two parts, the other is to sort the two arrays and then we want to merge them back. Right? So all of you have seen the lecture slides, so I am going to go through them a little fast. And if you have doubts in any particular slide, please stop me. So here is how you might write merge sort in C++. So this is some simple, uh, you know, getting the inputs and validating them. Here we have taken an array A of size 100, which means we will store at most 100 elements to sort, 100 integers to sort at most. And then we read in the integers. And then we call this uh, function merge sort A0n. A is of course the array. And this 0 and n basically say that the part of the array of interest to us is between 0 and n minus 1. n is the total number of elements, 0 is the starting element, okay? 0 to n minus 1. Now how does merge sort look like? So as precondition, we require start to be less than end and both to be within the array bounds. Remember this is the starting index and I should be seeing up to end minus 1. So from start to end minus 1 is the part of the array of interest. And as post condition, I want the part of the array from start to end minus 1 to be sorted, let us say in decreasing order. So the first thing we check is the termination condition if the array has just one element, which means if end minus 1 is equal to start, or in other words, if end is equal to start plus 1, then everything is sorted, we are done. Otherwise, we calculate the midpoint, which is start plus end over 2, and then we sort the two parts, the part of the array from start to mid minus 1 and the part of the array from mid to n minus 1. And how do we sort them? We recursively call merge sort again. That's what we decided last time. We are going to recursively call that. And then we are going to merge these two sorted subarrays. And how do I specify the two sorted subarrays? So I pass these arguments to merge sorted subarrays. So this is of course the entire array of numbers. And the two sorted subarrays within that are the part from start to mid minus 1 and the part from mid to n minus 1. Those are the two parts that we want to sort, right? So instead of actually passing two arrays, I have passed one array and I have given the ranges of indices between which the two subarrays exist. Okay, so this is the most important function, merge sorted subarrays. So as precondition, we will assume that A start through A mid minus 1 is already sorted in decreasing order and similarly A mid through A n minus 1 is already sorted in decreasing order. Right? Merge sorted subarrays. So the subarrays should already be sorted. And as post condition, we require that start through n minus 1 should itself be completely sorted. Right? And in decreasing order, of course. So within this function, if you remember from last time, we had this picture of two sorted subarrays and we had two arrows, right? Indicating which element now I'm considering. So think of those two arrows as i and j. So i is the running index for the second sub uh, for the first subarray and j is the running index for the second subarray right so those two arrows are like i and j and then as we were so we had these two arrows pointing to these two subarrays two elements of two subarrays and we were checking which one of them is greater and putting them in the sorted array right so that sorted array for the time being let us say that we are going to create a copy of a call it temp a in which we will put the sorted elements Right? So there were these two subarrays and we were picking up elements and putting them there. So think of this as the two sorted subarrays and this is a temp A. So this is the part where I'll store the sorted elements. And index is, so you know this merged and sorted subarray will be temporarily stored in temp A and finally it will be copied back to A. And this index is the index in that temporary array where the next sorted element should go to. Right? If you remember there were two sorted arrays. I was comparing the two, putting one of them there, incrementing that index, again comparing the two, putting one of them there, incrementing the index and so on. So index is the index in that temporary array where the next sorted element should appear. Okay, so this is the basic merging loop. What we do is we initialize the two arrows i and j to the starting points of the two subarrays. So i is initialized to start, j is initialized to mid because the two subarrays are from start through mid minus 1 and mid through n minus 1, right? 
and then I'm going to iterate as long as there is still some element left in one of the subarrays. So as long as either i is less than mid or j is less than n, I'm going to iterate. And I have not shown the increments over here because if I'm choosing from the first subarray, then I should increment i. If I'm choosing from the second subarray, I should increment j. So that incrementing will happen inside the body of the for loop. But in any case, in every iteration of the for loop, the next sorted element is going to go in its rightful place. So index should increase because index is the position where the next sorted element should come. Right? So how does the body of the for loop look like? There are two cases. One is when the two subarrays are not fully seen yet. So we are in the middle of both the subarrays and the other case is when one of the subarrays has been fully seen. So if one of the subarrays has been fully seen, that's the easier case. What do we do? We just copy the elements from the other subarray, which is already sorted into tempe. So this can be implemented like this. So if i is less than mid, it means the first subarray has not been fully seen yet, right? Because the first subarray goes from start through mid minus one. So then I'll just copy the next element from the first subarray to tempe and increment i. And otherwise, it's the second subarray which is not yet fully seen. But remember, this is in the else part of this condition. So clearly, this condition is false, which means either i is reached mid or j has reached end. So if i is less than mid, then j must have reached end, which means the second subarray has been seen. And if i is not less than mid, then i is equal to mid, which means that the first subarray has been seen. So I'll just copy from the second subarray. Right? That's fairly straightforward. And otherwise, if none of the two subarrays are fully seen yet, what did we do in that picture we saw last time? We compared the two, the elements at the two arrows, whichever one was greater, we took it to the next sorted position. So that, that's what we'll do here. We'll figure out if AJ is greater than AI, I and J are the two indices. And if AJ is greater than AI, I'll copy AJ to temp A index. This is the next position in the sorted array. And I'll increment J, otherwise I'll copy AI to temp A and increment I, okay? So that's the whole story of the merging loop. And this is the most crucial step in merge sort. Okay. So after we have done all of this merging, the sorted array is actually now in temp A. So we'll now have to copy it back to A because we finally want A to be sorted. So that's what this copy thing will do. And I'm sure all of you can do that, copying one array to another between the indices start and n minus one. Good. So now let's try to understand, we did this analysis for selection sort, let's try to understand how we can do this for merge sort, counting the number of basic steps. So I, I realized that there are several questions about what is a basic step. So let me try to you know spend a couple of minutes on that. So whenever we are trying to analyze the running time of a program or the running time of an algorithm given, so there will be one part of the running time which will depend on the input size, right? In this case, the size of the array n. Clearly, the time taken to sort an array of size 2 is not going to be the same as the time taken to sort an array of size 2 million, right? So there will be some dependence of the running time on the actual size of the input. But there are steps in the program which are going to be executed whether the array is of size 2 or the array is of size 2 million. For example, comparing two elements of an array, reading an array at a specified index updating an array at a specified index. So each of these steps will have to be executed, whether the array is of size two or the array is of size two million. The question is how many times are these steps executed? That will depend on the size of the array. So what we mean by a basic step is something, some computation that is done, which takes a certain fixed amount of time independent of the size of the array. And then we will count how many times are these steps going to be repeated as a function of the size of the array. So is that clear? So what we mean by basic steps is some steps that will be executed independent of the array size and they will be executed multiple times depending on what the size of the array is. So we want to get that unit. How many times is that unit going to be repeated? That will be a function of the size of the array. But that unit which will be repeated is what I'm calling a basic step. And the time taken for doing that unit which could be for example reading specified two specified array elements AI and AJ comparing them is AI greater than AJ. Writing an element in tempe, tempe index is assigned something, right? Incrementing I, incrementing index, all of these. So the total amount of time taken to do, you know, to do each of these steps once, reading an array element, updating an array element, comparing two array elements, this is independent of how many elements there are in the array. 
and we will repeat these operations several times depending on how many elements there are in there. Is this clear? So basically we are trying to count the total time as some function of the size of the array times some basic operations. And the time taken for these basic operations is independent of the size of the array. So that's what we mean by basic steps. Is this clear what we mean by basic steps? It's a slightly hand waving abstract notion. But the point to remember is that the total time will be some function of n, some function of the size of the array times the time taken for a basic step. So the time taken for a basic step should be independent of the size of the array. These are steps that need to be taken no matter what the size of the array is, how many times you take this step should be a function of the size of the array. Is that clear? The actual time taken for these steps really does not matter because it's going to be a fixed time. It could be 50 nanoseconds, 100 nanoseconds, whatever, depending on the computer you're using. But it's some fixed amount of time repeated some function of n number of times and we want to find out what that function of n is. Okay, so let's try to understand how many basic steps will be there in merge sorted subarrays. So there are these two sorted subarrays, a star through a mid minus 1 and a mid through a n minus 1, each of size n over 2. So as we have seen from that, uh, you know, animation we showed last time, in each of the subarrays, the arrow just keeps moving down. So it just makes one pass over the subarray, right? So basically, and, and what happens as the arrow moves down, I read two elements, compare them, copy one of them to temp a, and then the arrow moves down. Right? So all of that I can think of as one basic step, takes some fixed amount of time. But how many times the arrow moves down, of course, depends on the sizes of the two subarrays. Right? So the sizes of the two subarrays are n by 2. So there will be at most n by 2 basic steps to pass over the first subarray, at most n by 2 basic steps to iterate over the second subarray. So at most n basic steps to get the merged sorted array in temp a. And then we have to copy that temp a back to a. So we have to copy n elements, so there will be n basic steps to copy, right? So total of 2n basic steps, fine? So now we want to count the number of steps. So this was the total of 2n basic steps in merge sorted subarrays. So what is the number of basic steps in merge sort? So in order to understand this, let's say that we do not know what this number is going to be, what is this going to be as a function of n, but let that function of n be called tn. So t subscript n means the number of steps number of basic steps to merge sort an array of size n. And if you look at this uh, function that we just wrote, what are the steps involved in merging an array of size n? This will take some constant amount of time, right? Computing the midpoint, checking termination condition, and then the real amount of time will be here, but these themselves are merge sort with half the sizes of the arrays, and finally I'm going to merge them. So it is something like this, that to sort an array of size n, I'll have to sort two subarrays of size n by 2 and then I have to merge these two sorted subarrays which we have just seen takes time, number of basic steps 2n, right? And uh, this is for the first recursive call, that's for the second recursive call and that's for merge, merging them. And of course when the array is of size 1, it just takes one basic step, it's already sorted, right? Now if you solve this recurrence relation, there are several ways to solve it, uh, you know, I'm sure most of you already know about it. But if you solve this recurrence relation, you'll find that the solution is roughly 2n times log n base 2 plus n ceiling of that. Okay, and this is quite close to what we had promised in the earlier lecture, a sorting technique which takes number of basic steps uh, proportional to n times log n base 2. This is much better than n squared, which was the case for selection sort. How much better is it? So here is a plot, I don't know if it's visible. So the blue part is how the number of basic steps for selection sort increases with array sizes increasing from 10 to 100. The orange part is how the number of basic steps for merge sort increases with the array size increasing from 10 to 100 and you can clearly see that the gap is increasing and the gap will increase further as we, as n increases, right? And this is the difference between the growth of n minus 1 times n plus 2 by 2 which is for selection sort and 2n times log n base 2 plus n, which is for merge sort. Good. So, so therefore, this is going to be much faster than selection sort, right? Are there any doubts about this part of the lecture?